morning, everybody. It's, um, it's great to be here with you this morning. Um, I've been here for the last three weeks now, but this is the first time I've preached for ages. Um, and at the start of the last service, when I stood up, I got that sort of nervous butterfly, which I hadn't had for a really long time. Quite a humbling experience, I guess. Not quite as scary as taking my guitar in to sing to 440 kids on um, Thursday morning at St. Michael's School. That was terrifying. It went okay, by the grace of God, and I'm still alive. Um, so I, I get the privilege and pleasure then of speaking uh, to us this morning uh, from Mark chapter 12. If you have a Bible, you are welcome to turn there. We'll read that passage of scripture in just a moment, verses 1 to 12. But before that, let me just recap for us where we've been since we got back into Mark's gospel after Easter. We have seen the prophetic action of Jesus as he walked into the temple and in a non-violent confrontation with the powers that be in that place, he drove out the money changers and the sellers of um, sacrificial animals because that's not what God's house was intended for. His house should be a house of prayer and they turned it into a place where things were being bought and sold and people were being uh, ripped off um, in their religious pilgrimage. And so then Jesus has um, the first of many showdowns with the religious leaders of his day as he is asked the question of where does your authority come from? Who's in charge here? Is what they're asking Jesus. And so Jesus very cleverly, very wisely redirects the question back at us. That's what Bruce got us to think about last week by asking them where the authority of John the Baptist had come from. Because John the Baptist was a popular leader in his day and he'd lost his life for the challenging message of repentance that he had come preaching. And so in both these instances then, opposition to Jesus and his message is increasing. And today, as we'll find out when we reach the end of this passage, in verse 12, it will become very obvious to us that the religious leaders knew that Jesus was talking about them with this parable that he used. And so they resolve within themselves to have him arrested. They need to get rid of this problematic man who is taking power and authority and prestige and privilege away from them, and they don't like that. Okay? So let me um, just bring up the PowerPoint for today. Now, whenever I talk about cultural references, particularly relating to TV, nobody's got any idea <coughs> what I'm talking about. Partly because there's so much choice in the world, Netflix, wherever else you stream TV from. There's so much choice, and everyone goes, oh, you should watch this series. I watched it, it was great. Six months later, we forgot about it. So I've increased my chances, I think, by referencing something from the BBC. Does anyone know this program? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Yes, a cultural reference that people will get and understand and remember. This is the third series of Race Across the World. And so five teams set off from Vancouver and they are working their way via seven checkpoints to an eighth and final checkpoint in Newfoundland. We're going to find out who wins on Wednesday night. Anyone who's watching it can't wait. Marked it in the diary. I'm busy that night watching TV. Um, and there are two pairs of contestants that I would like to draw your attention to in particular. You may or may not have favourites or least favourites when you've been watching this programme. My favourite partnership duo are Monique and Laddie on the very left. Yeah, they're a father and daughter partnership and they're working really well with each other. Yeah, he's not trying to take a strong lead. He's actually deferring to his daughter a lot of the time. So if you're watching the programme, you're putting two and two together to know that I'm going to tell you about Kevin and Claudia. Yeah. Okay, yes, there we go. There's my first. These two here, yeah? yeah. Kevin's a bit of a core blimey governor sort of guy. <laughs> he's always telling Claudia they'll get a taxi, rinsing through cash like nobody's business. And he doesn't listen to a thing his daughter says to him. On the whole. Well, is that fair? I'm not mischaricaturing him there. He's just got a, a strong sense of authority about himself and he knows the way he's going to lead. He knows what he wants to achieve and he's going to get it done and take Claudia along for the journey with him. Okay. All that to say, A, yes, I finally found a cultural reference from the television that people know and understand. And B, what we're going to see in this passage of scripture is that sort of general attitude towards authority of my way or the other way. We're going to do things the way we want to do it, and we don't, know, we don't mind how other people feel along the way. So with that, let's read Mark chapter 12, verses 1 to 12. And so this is Jesus speaking. 
He began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the winepress and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit from the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent them another servant and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another and him they killed and so with many others. Some they beat and some they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent to hit them, uh, him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvellous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. Sometimes when we read scripture, it can be hard to maybe find the message that Jesus is trying to share with us, What's the image that he's trying to conjure up so that he can make his teaching point? Yeah, we could maybe read two or three different characters into one illustration or situation. Not so with this passage of scripture. This is a very clear metaphor that Jesus is trying to paint for the way God's kingdom plans and purposes are unfolding. The man who owns the vineyard is God. The vineyard is the people of Israel, God's people, his chosen people. The servants are his prophets. The beloved son is the beloved son. That's really obvious. Okay? And the wicked tenants are the religious leaders of the day who God has been trying to get the attention of time and time again, yet they reject and cast out the prophets and eventually the son. But I don't want to get too carried away myself. So the vineyard is where we start. This is a metaphor through scripture for the people of God. <coughs> the most obvious place that we find that is in Isaiah chapter 5. If you have your Bible, you might be able to turn there and see for yourselves. We're looking at verses 1 and 2 and 7 of Isaiah chapter 5. Let me read those for us. It says, Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it and he looked for it to yield grapes. We'll stop there before we read the last phrase in that sentence. Here again, God is the man who is preparing the vineyard and God has gone out of his way to make sure that the conditions are perfect for a good fruit to come from his people. Uh, and this takes us back to the story of Genesis chapter 12 and Abraham, who's been given a promise that a great people will come from him, that those people will be a blessing in the world to the people that they encounter. This was God's promise to be with his people and use them for flourishing, to be in a relationship with them, to bless the whole world around them. And so the, the situation is perfectly prepared. The covenant relationship that God is in with his people the statutes, the rules, the commandments that he's given them that they might flourish and have life in all of its fullness. And so then he comes at the right time expecting to see that harvest. The conditions were perfect, right? Yeah? And then when he gets there, he finds wild grapes. Something's crept in and corrupted the crop. Uh, the other words we could use there for wild might be um, sour or stinking. Yeah? Yeah? in the Hebrew, sour or stinking grapes. I don't know if you've ever tried a sour food that wasn't what you were expecting it to be and it sort of really gets in your mouth and you can't really get rid of it, yeah? And that's what these grapes in this vineyard had produced. And so what was the fruit that God was looking for? Well, it says in verse seven of Isaiah chapter five that the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. There you go, that's it being unpacked for us. The men of Judah are his pleasant planting. They are the vine that has been planted. And God was looking for justice. 
but behold, bloodshed. God was looking for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. Now, I can't take credit for this because I'm an amazing Hebrew scholar. I'm not. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not even a terrible Hebrew scholar. I'm not a Hebrew scholar at all. But something that we miss in the English translation of that verse is the really similar sounding words for justice and bloodshed and righteousness and an outcry. If you say them out loud, they are almost identical. You'd need to know what you were listening to to pick out what is being said to you. And so where God was looking for justice, a good, noble thing, he found bloodshed. People were being killed. That's an injustice. Yeah, that's the opposite of justice that God was looking for. God was looking for a righteous people, but instead he hears an outcry because the people are living in an unrighteous environment. That's like the word that is used of the cries of God's people that reach the ears of the Lord when they are being oppressed by foreign leaders. Yeah, so this is the people in Egypt crying out, Lord, we're in a difficult situation, would you save us? We are enslaved, would you set us free, yeah? That's the outcry that God is hearing from his people when he should be hearing cries of righteousness, yeah? So two things that we can take away from that. One, that the holy standard that God had set for his people to live by was not being lived up to. And the other thing is that there is a distortion between good and evil practice, okay? Within that people. And doesn't that sound like a word in season for the way we find the church at the moment? There are many churches that don't look all that dissimilar to the world around them. We've taken good things and corrupted them with evil, and we've taken evil things and said that they are good. And that same thing is going on in Mark chapter 12, when the Pharisees, experts in the law, the law that was supposed to give people human flourishing and freedom and wholeness was being used as a weight over them that they could not bear. And that's why Jesus came and he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Because the way that he was calling people to live was not one that was oppressive, but set them free. And the reason the Pharisees were living in this way was because it brought prestige, privilege and honour to them and they got to benefit from the oppression of the people as they tried to live under this heavy weight of the law. And so just like God says in Isaiah, I've come looking for the fruit that I'm expecting, we arrive in Mark's Gospel and the fruit that could be expected to come from the vineyard is not available to the owner. The fruit that God is expecting is not there for him. The people send the servants away beaten, or in some cases, killed. Jesus talks about the vine in John 15, doesn't he? He talks about him being the vine and that we are the branches grafted into the vine, part of God's family, that the Father in heaven is the vine dresser who seeks to snip off any branches, prune them back that aren't bearing fruit. I think we understand and see where this passage might be going. And so here is the vineyard, not bearing the fruit that God expects it to bear. But you know, I think in many cases, God gives notice. Okay? There's occasions, right? If you're a Christian, you'll know this. Sometimes God comes up behind you and gives you a slap on the back of the head. But if we're really honest with ourselves, there's probably been some notice given prior to that. We've just not been paying attention. Okay? So I'll tell you a story. If you're new, you won't have heard this one. If you've been here a while, I apologise. I'm telling the story again. One day you'll be able to tell it for me. Before I was a Christian, when I met Lucy, I said to her, if God's real, why don't you pray that he would show himself to me? What a mean prayer request that was. Okay? That's got a lot of weight to it, and it matters that that prayer is answered, right? Probably one of the meanest things I've ever asked Lucy to do. All right? So she prayed for me that God would give me a sign. So every month, I bought my favourite heavy metal magazine, Terrorizer. The clue's in the name of how bad that magazine is, okay? <laughs> this is, I haven't bought it for decades now, okay? Well, over a decade. Right. But I used to buy Terrorizer every month, and it had all these dreadful bands that I used to love listening to, reviews, articles, news, etc., etc. 
and they'd always have like special articles in there. And one of them, and it was listed on the front cover, and honestly, I'd asked Lucy to pray for me two days before this had hit the shelves. There was a whole four or five page section in there on Christian heavy metal bands. Praise the Lord that it's not all hymns and acoustic guitars, okay? There's rap music if you're into that too, but I like my Christian heavy metal music. I wouldn't ever force it on any of you. But there was this article, and do you know what? I didn't, I didn't notice that, I read it. Didn't really think, oh yeah, I'd ask God for a sign that he was real and that he wanted to know me and speak to me and reveal himself to me, I just completely ignored it. Some time passes and Lucy said, you know you've got that sign that you're looking for, right? But there it is in your magazine. I said, yeah, of course, God gave me notice. God was trying to get my attention. And God's been trying to do that with his people. He's been giving them notice that he wants their attention, he wants their hearts back. But their hearts are hard, disobedient, idolatrous. And so God has been sending his servants to prophets to tell his people to turn their hearts back to him. God gives people an opportunity to repent. God is kind and gracious. God just doesn't sneak up, sneak up on us and go, boo, got ya, <laughs> judgment, gone, see you later. That's not how God works. God takes the initiative. We see the initiative in the cross that God sends his son into the world. We haven't got there yet because we're still sending the servants. But the servants aren't listening. And interestingly, Jesus talks here about a servant who was struck on the head. Wounded in the head is the Greek. I'm not a Greek expert either. But who does that sound like? Who was the prophet who was wounded in the head for coming and bringing a message of repentance that the people of the day didn't want to hear? John the Baptist. Wounded in the head. Treated shamefully. And he sent another and another, and another, and they were beaten, and they were killed, and they were rejected, and they were ignored. So at this point, right, let's use our car park as an analogy. Some folks have moved in, and they're living in our car park. We can't get in on a Sunday morning. We politely ask them to leave. We give them maybe some written warning that we've asked them to leave because it's private property. What's the next stage? Do you go, oh, George? You're our beloved pastor. Please go out and deal with them. Just usher them off. Or do you call the council and call the police and ask them to take care of this difficult situation for you? Please say the council and the police. I assume I would have been there at the start when I politely asked them to leave at some point, yeah? And so the method that God chooses is not the obvious method. But it's the method that he had promised in Genesis 3.15. That he would send someone into the world to put right the wrong that had been done. That one would come who would crush the head of the serpent. And so, very clearly, God sends in his beloved son to deal with the situation. But they don't listen to him either. We know the full story, right? We know that Jesus is crucified for the message that he brought that challenged and threatened the religious leaders of his day, yeah? They were in a comfortable, affluent position. They didn't need someone coming and telling them that you're doing it all wrong. You've missed the point. You're leading people astray. You need to do it this way. Because they'd have had to change their entire way of living. And so they have him arrested, beaten, taken out of Jerusalem and killed in the place of the skull, Golgotha. Because when they see the sun coming, they go, well, this is the heir. If we kill him, if we get rid of him, we can have it our way until kingdom come. That's what a corrupted, hardened heart does. It says, right, I'm going to get my own way. I'm going to use this for my own benefit. But in so doing, what looks like a defeat for the son and the father, the owner of the vineyard, what looks like a victory for the powers of darkness, is actually the very method by which God was going to secure victory. And in doing so, he was going to remove the wicked tenants. Matthew 21, 43 gives us a very vivid picture of what is going on here, that the kingdom of God is being taken away from the unfruitful people and being given to the people who are bearing the kingdom's fruit. 
The way is being made open to Gentiles like you and I to become part of God's kingdom family. And, and that the power that was being held by the religious leaders was being broken and taken away from them. The stone, the Messiah, that the builders rejected, the builders being the leaders of Israel, the rejection being the ignorance, the beating, the <coughs> spitting, the mockery, and the crucifixion of Jesus. That stone had been cast out as irrelevant, useless, and inconvenience has now become the cornerstone. And so in some translations, it might be cornerstone, which is the, the, the stone at the bottom of a building, the foundation on which the walls of the building are built. Or you might read that it's a capstone, which is the stone that is put on the top to hold all things together underneath it. But can I tell you that both work for Jesus because he is the firm foundation on which we build our lives and he is the capstone holding all of our lives and the whole of creation together, is he not? Yes, he is. Something to be excited about, I would submit to you. And so what looked like a defeat, what looked like bad news, what looked like everything had gone wrong, is ultimately what God used to bring about victory. And it is marvellous in our eyes. Yeah? It is marvellous. The cross is a marvellous thing in our eyes because it means that Jesus has been exalted into the highest place, that his enemies have been made a footstool for his feet, that the dividing wall of hostility between God and human beings made in his image has been torn down, the way has been made that we can go back to our Father and be in a relationship with him and find healing and wholeness, spiritually, <coughs> physically, emotionally, relationally, in this life and in the life to come. Amen. Hallelujah. I could go home there, but I'm not going to. We've got some more. What does this mean? Well, there's a couple of things that I want to take away from this. The first is about God's response to an abuse of leadership, an abuse of authority. Culturally, we are very used to seeing leaders fail, okay? At least monthly, we're getting stories about people doing things wrong. In politics, business, sport, local government, it doesn't have to be big, you know, prime ministers and stuff, but them too. Lying, cheating, stealing, abusing the power and the authority that they've given to their own end, But we expect it, right? What would you expect from godless people? Nothing more. Right? It's the reality of a broken world that people will respond in broken ways. But what is sad is when that creeps into the church, into Christian leadership, where positions of authority, no matter how high or how low those positions of authority are, are used for personal gain, for platforming, for for physical abuse, whether that's sexual or not, whether cultures of fear and coercion and intimidation are created to exact control over people. These things are all really sad when they come into the church. And it's really hard to preach on this this morning, right? Because I feel like, yes, I could have one finger pointed out, but three fingers pointing back, but also plenty of people who might say, well, there's ways that you've maybe not used your power and authority in the way that you should have done. Leadership is really challenging, okay? Someone told me to say that in this service, because I didn't say it in the last service. Whether it's Christian leadership or secular leadership, as a Christian or not, leadership is a challenge. Yeah? And there is grace for people who come to God and when called out on the way that they might have led inappropriately, ask forgiveness of the people that they've misled and ask forgiveness from God for misleading his people. There is definitely forgiveness for that. But we hear it all of the time, right? Every now and again, there's another headline about a Christian leader who's done something wrong. <coughs> Rabbi Zacharias, after he died, came to light that he'd done loads of things that were really unhelpful. Yeah? That's my polite way of putting it. But it's not always physical stuff, all right? Sometimes it can be emotional things as well. Mark Bristol, the American pastor, have you, any of you ever heard of him? 
absolutely wonderful preacher, really influential in my coming to faith and growing as a disciple of Jesus. But he was a bully. He intimidated people. He was nasty with the power that he had. Yeah? And when he was called out on it, rather than say sorry, he just quit his church, walked away, and set up a new one two years later. That's not a very godly thing to do, right? And most recently, and I even had some guy who's not a Christian on the school run say to me, oh, have you heard about Mike Pilavachi? Yeah? Really sad story, and we don't know the outcome of it. The investigation is still underway. I'm not making any judgment on him. The process isn't finished. But it's really sad when Christian leaders fall because not only does it destroy their reputation, no big deal. It destroys the reputation of Jesus. And at the moment, doesn't the culture love being able to take pop shots at evangelical Christians? Yeah? Because we're not nice people. Right? And sometimes we don't help ourselves because the press can drag us through the mud because we've dragged ourselves through it first in the way we act. And I think what Bruce made really clear for us last week was that Jesus showed us a way to use and live with authority and power in our own lives over the people that are around us. Because Jesus was a man who had great authority in heaven <coughs> and on earth, but he used that authority with great control. He humbled himself. He was a servant. He didn't say to the disciples, wash my feet. He said, let me wash your feet for you. He put a towel on his robe and took a bowl of water and washed their feet and served them. That's the model that Jesus gives us. And so, yes, very specifically in this passage, we are looking at leadership within the church. But this applies to all of us, whether pastor and elders or a team leader. Are we using our positions for our own gain, for our own benefit? Are we leading the people well or are we coercing and controlling? <coughs> and is God calling us to stop and lead the way that Jesus led? I would suggest to you, yes, he is, because God is a God who gives none of us. He gives us opportunity to repent. <coughs> One of the standout things from yesterday. Now, I made a mistake in the last service. I said I wasn't a realist, right? But neither of my auntie were, okay? I, if, it's, if it's possible to sit on the fence and you can argue with me afterwards about it, I'm sitting on the fence, okay? One of the standout things for me yesterday, though, was when he made a declaration, Charles, that he would do his best to serve and lead following the example that Jesus Christ had offered him. Yeah? And he's made some mistakes in the past. He'll probably make some mistakes in the future. Monarch or not, right? We get that, don't we? Yeah. Made some mistakes in the past? Mm. Going to make some in the future? Yes. Amen. 100%. Guaranteed. <coughs> but every time, every time we can come back to Jesus and we can say sorry. We can restore those broken relationships with the people around us that are sin hurt. And we can know that we will be restored. The other thing that someone said to me in the last service, I've never had so much feedback about a sermon, by the way. Um, not, not that quickly. Um, was that we need to pray for people in leadership. There's that very clear command in Timothy about praying for the kings and the leaders, right? But praying for our elders, praying for me, praying for one another, ministry team leaders, praying for us, that we don't fall, that we don't make mistakes that we lead in a godly and kind and humble Christ-like way. That's something we can do for each other. Because if we're praying for one another, that we would lead well and with integrity, that's a better starting point than saying, you don't lead well and with integrity. Pray for one another. And my second and final point, because Ruth would like to lead communion today. <coughs> God will take a difficult and desperate and broken situation and he will do something amazing with it. It's very clear in this passage that the stone that had been rejected, the son of God who had been crucified and laid in a tomb came back to life. 
and is restored from his rejection to the point, the place of all praise and honour, because he is the firm foundation, the cornerstone of our faith. And so, no matter what we find ourselves facing today, no matter how small, no matter how insignificant it might seem in the, in the grand scale of things, it might seem out of the blue and unplanned and unprepared for us because it wasn't what we were hoping for. But it's not a surprise to God and it's not something that God can't take and use for his glory. God's ways are higher than our ways. If we were going to bring about the kingdom of God and the correction of sin, we probably wouldn't think that crucifixion was the place to start. We probably wouldn't think a humble carpenter was the guy for the job. You know, someone gave me a Superman t-shirt this week, it's my birthday coming up. We look for the guy wearing the Superman t-shirt, right? Not me. Um, but you know what I mean, right? We look for that strong, powerful, persuasive leader who's going to bring about what we expect, but that's not the way God works. And so we need to remember that. And there's something else that I wrote in my notes during the worship, based on something that um, Jacinta prayed, prayed for us. The eyes of Jesus are on each one of us. I could almost guarantee that yesterday there would have been people lining the mall, yeah, the mall, sorry, <laughs> hoping that the king would look at them. And I guarantee you, someone would have gone, he looked at me, not the person behind me, not you, he looked at me. You know it, right? I'm not wrong, am I? Someone would have thought that, even if they didn't say it out loud. He looked at me. The reality is this is the sea of faces. The king wouldn't recognise a single person by the time he'd got another metre down the road. Because there's so many people. Not so with King Jesus. Right? He looks on each of us. He's aware of each of us. And we don't have to fight for attention and go, he's looking at me, and he's not looking at you. He's looking at all of us. So whatever situation we find ourselves in today, Jesus is looking at us. Jesus is aware. He is the king who reigns victorious over us, no matter how broken we can feel things. Let's pray together. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. I pray and ask that if there's anything unhelpful that I've said, you would take it away from our hearts, our minds, and our spirits. If there is anything that I've failed to say that you wanted your people to hear by your spirit Lord would you <coughs> place it within our hearts and our minds Lord where there is an encouragement help us to receive it where there is a rebuke or a correction Lord help us to receive it equally with grace we say sorry Jesus for the ways in which we may have acted in an ungodly manner abusing any small amount of power and authority we feel that we've been given for our own gain. <coughs> Lord, if there is anyone that we have wronged, we pray and ask for your grace in that relationship and your restoring power. Lord, we place before you any difficult situation we find ourselves facing where we can't see a way out when we can't see a solution or a positive outcome. And we thank you for the truth that the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. That this was your doing, Lord. And it's marvellous in our eyes. Lord, would you hear our prayer in the name of Jesus.